Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Welcome, everybody, to our new podcast series, Data Movers. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, CEO and founder of JSA, and along with my co host, top B2B social influencer, Evan Christel. Hey everyone, and welcome to Data Movers, where we sit down with the most influential men and women of today's leading telecom and data center world, uh, delivering the requirements of this new normal. Uh, Jamie, how are you doing? Doing well, Evan, you know, living the, the fabulous SoCal life here. I was reading some of the headlines before the show, and I see that Stripe uh, raised $600 million in Series H funding and is its valuation of $95 billion makes it the biggest private unicorn in the history of the world. What do yeah. you make of all these numbers? Silicon Valley, baby. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's insane. It's insane. And I guess uh, um, Stripe now uh, has actually pushed ahead of Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX, which was valued at $74 billion in February. Um, which was at that time the most valuable U.S.-based tech startup. I mean, it's in, it's insane times. I mean, what what used to be you know millions uh, now we're talking billions. Um, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's an insane world, right? Yeah, and I, I I'm always somewhat dubious of these valuations, but payments is and and, and banking and. And e-commerce is just a, such a huge part of our lives now, particularly in the pandemic. And these, com these, these numbers kind of make sense to me when you consider the global scale of the banking and finance and payments industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if I look at PayPal, I started my, my own business seven years ago on PayPal. If I didn't have PayPal, I wouldn't have been able to really launch what I do. So, you know, payments is really fundamental now to everything we do. So, you know, good luck to them. Yeah, and it's uh, helping every mom and pop shop who had to go uh, digital during the pandemic. Uh, so many uh, great uh, cases of, of those pivots uh, for their business models where they had to learn how to build a website and, and take transactions online. But uh, also with, you know, Stripe, we use it here at JSA. We, you know, the clients use it, uh, no matter how national or global they may be. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a good business model. Definitely, you know, one of those businesses I wish I had thought of. <laughs> well, speaking of ideas and innovation in action, we have a great guest today, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, I want to say he is one of the true um, uh, needle movers in our industry. Um, I'm really excited um, of our guest today. Um, please welcome leading industry journalist, Jao Marquez Lima. Jao, welcome to Data Movers. And I thank you for having me. So, Joe, welcome. Uh, I've really been following you for for years on social media. It's really nice to finally make this uh, uh, human to human connection here on the podcast. Uh, I guess my first question is: You dub yourself a mediapreneur. Uh, <laughs> explain to us what that is. And I see journalism is also uh, on, on your profile. Are you a last breed of, of, of sort of real journalists out there in this new media landscape? Well, I would like to think so. <laughs> um, I mean, on the first question, so the media for now, I, I think that's just more, I mean, as a journalist, we say we hate jargon and things like this, but I kind of liked the word when I saw it for the first time. So it's not my words. Um, I don't know where it came from, but I just liked it. It's the mixture between media and entrepreneurship. Um, and taking into account my past, I have created a few publications um, so I kind of dip my toes into the entrepreneurship within the, the media space. So therefore, um, I meet a entrepreneur. Um, as a journalist, I mean, I hope so. Um, I've been doing this for about, what now, six, seven years um, in the data center space for the past five years, more or less. Um, so it's going well. I mean, there's a lot of stories there um, in the real world, as we call it sometimes when it comes to journalism, so the politics and um, even jihadists and everything. And then you have the tech side of things so with IoT and data centers, um, which has been my big focus in my journalistic career, to be fair. And you've had the opportunity over the years to really interview some of the top movers and shakers in our industry. 
Are there any interviews that stick out top of mind as most memorable? I mean, I've got loads. <laughs> the best ones is when you actually learn something from these people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's the CEO of Schneider Electric, Jean-Pascal Tricoire, um, who is really good when it comes to climate and sustainability. Um, and he also teaches how to take care of a company with more, I think, than 200,000 employees. Yeah. Um, so hearing someone talking about that is something quite uh, striving. Um, there was, of course, Steve Smith, who at the time was the CEO of Equinix. Um, there was Bill Stein, the CEO of Digital Realty, John Conqueron, CEO of Global Switch, who we, I learned a lot about financials. Um, so that was a very good, it was more like a lesson slash interview than so much of an interview. Uh, so that was really good. Um, I mean, I had my Justin Trudeau moment. Uh, so when the PM in Canada spoke about quantum computing, I had that with the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, um, who I had been briefed that he didn't really know anything about data centers. And then in the end, I had to kind of transform the interview as I was speaking to him because he knew more than I thought he did. <laughs> um, I mean, there's John Curian as well. So the brother of Thomas Curian, the CEO of Google. Um, so that's a, that was a very good life lesson um, on how to come from a humble background and then grow to the top. So that was very good. Um, Manuel Medina, CEO of Sixtera, which has now been IPO'd uh, through one of the SPACs um, and talking about opportunities and equality uh, within uh, underrepresented layers of the society, especially in this case, the Latin American um, layer of the US. Um, Bill Barney, who is probably the best person to go to for stuff related to Asia. Um, and then, I mean, there's a lot more people that I could name, but one that I really like, always makes me laugh, is someone called Nicola Hayes. So she's a consultant in the UK, but every time we do an interview, I mean, it's it's just a laugh. I mean, I remember the last time we did an interview was in Morocco, um, in Marrakesh, and we have just had like a laugh attack and we couldn't do anything for ages, um, but it was really fun. But you learn a lot with her. I mean, her research is really good um, and you really get some really good insights. And at the same time, you have so much fun <laughs> just doing it. Um, that's probably like a longer answer than you wanted, but there's a lot, a lot of names. I mean, there's so many more names I could name. Oh, and I love them all. And, and Nicola, she's a, a dear friend and uh, I'm glad you ended with her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, I remember Marrakesh very well. It was, yeah, we just laughed. We couldn't finish the interview. <laughs> it was really, <laughs> it was hilarious. Wow, that, that's quite a uh, who's who of folks that you've interviewed. Uh, so who's on your bucket list, whether our industry or not? Who are you, uh, you know, wanting to interview next? And tell us about your approach or your pitch to, uh, to interview them. Hmm. I think, I mean, there's a lot of people like to go with the standard and say, like Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates. Uh, I mean, those will be very nice to sit down with. But I think now everything that's going on and all the change that we've had, maybe Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they are coming up to the 100 days in office. So a lot has been done. A lot is going to be done. Um, I mean, coming, I can't really say coming out of COVID, but getting through COVID now, um, there's all the issues with race, um, equality, um, economy, jobs. Uh, and of course, tech and digital will play a massive role in that. Um, and we know what's been left behind was probably not um, the best legacy in terms of digital and sustainability as well. So I think it'd be very interesting to sit down with her and go through all those topics um, of equality, um, both gender, race, um, sustainability, which is probably the biggest topic at the moment as well, probably even more important than COVID um, in the long term. Yeah. And yeah, just discuss the politics and what they are doing and how they're going to support the Valley uh, and the creation of other valleys even across the US. Um, and being the US, I mean, how are you guys going to support other countries, um, especially in poorer parts of the world as well, to also develop digitally? I think that's, uh, that's I'm so glad you mentioned that because there's um, a fabric, you know, I think we can get lost in data center and telecom uh, mm. to not see how, how much we penetrate and sustain and, and support other industries and um, how politics plays a role um, mm. and, and the tech space, of course, and, and um, and really global economy. Um, so yeah. with that said, are there any industry trends that you're following particularly close right now, considering we're in this pivotal time? Yeah, absolutely. But just adding to your, to your last point, there's actually one thing that I've always really tried to bring into my reporting. Um, and again, I'm going to use the expression real world, which is bring the politics and I mean, the real world case scenarios and use cases 
um, of how our industry impacts the rest and how the rest impacts us as well. Because I mean, a lot of it comes from outside. Um, and although regulation may have been missing a little bit over the last couple of decades, regulators are now coming into the industry and things are shaking up a little bit, which is quite interesting. Um, which comes then to the trends that I'm following. Uh, regulation not being so much one of them, even though things are changing, like I said, but I think the biggest one probably is really around climate um, and sustainability. Everyone has to be sustainable. And I mean, that is a good thing to be anyway. Um, I would not even like to almost call it a trend. I like to call it more, you have to do it. <laughs> um, there, there isn't like a choice and not, not to be part of this trend. Um, I think on the financial side, it's quite interesting is really our industry has been done through just new developments and m and uh, which we've had a lot over the last five, six years. I mean, we had some huge multi-billion dollar transactions. Um, but now we are running out of people to buy or brands to buy, which is very interesting, which means the market is changing and there's so much money out there. I mean, investors have more money than they have places to spend it with, uh, spend it at, um, which is really interesting because you're going to see a lot of organic things popping up everywhere uh, and the of a lot of companies. And I mean, let's face it, data centers are one of the most profitable class asset, assets at the moment. I think it's growing at about 21% every year. Um, if you look at all the charts, I mean, compared to any other industry, any other verticals, let's again, the real world verticals, um, data centers are outperforming everything. Um, and I think this is gonna carry on for at least another 10, 20 years. Um, so that's quite safe. Um, I think then you have things like the hyperscalers as well, just keeping expanding. So that's a standard trend, let's call it like that. Um, but now it's interesting that they are moving into more undeveloped markets. So Southeast Asia, um, you're starting to see them dipping their toes into Africa, which is very, very interesting. I mean, there's a billion people in Africa um, and almost no data centers at all. I mean, um, New York has way more data centers than the entire the African continent. <laughs> and New York is what, 20 million people versus 1 billion. Um, so that kind of puts things in perspective. So we are very far behind on a global scale Let's put it that way. So there's a lot of opportunity, um, which then, I mean, the last trend I'm always watching and I really like, uh, and you've seen that with my work that I've done for you guys as well. It's the explosion of some of the markets. Um, so data centers coming into new markets, be it Spain in Europe, Italy, or be it India um, in Asia Pacific, being South Africa, Nigeria. Um, it's really fun to see those markets growing um, and investors really paying attention to them. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the most exciting time to be a tech journalist, uh, probably in the history of tech journalism. Certainly uh, a tech geek like myself is, is, is really uh, fascinated by, by all the emerging tech out there from electric vehicles to, to supersonic transport to uh, Hyperloop, uh, space travel. I mean, you name it, there's something really cool and innovative happening. So what are you most excited about in terms of emerging technologies? I mean, there's quite a lot. On a consumer level, I think screenless displays um, is quite an interesting one. Um, but that's just on my consumer capitalist side of things. Um, so I think that would be quite a cool, cool thing to have, not to have like this big LCD um, in your living room, just a black box when it's not on. Uh, and you can just project things or anything hologram wise, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. Um, so the screens display thing, I think that's going to be quite interesting. Um, for the industry, I think there's two probably big things, which is Graphene. Um, and I actually had the opportunity to interview Konstantin Novoselov, um, if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, he's a Russian British uh, physicist, and he actually won the Nobel Prize in 2010 um, with his um, partner, Andre Game. Game? can't pronounce these things properly. Um, but I mean, it, it's really interesting because it's graphene basically allows you to, in terms of communications will be faster, will allow the communications data, data, data transfers to be faster than they are now. Um, it reduces the, the carbon footprint as well because it consume less and you use less um, material than you will do with, um, with normal materials, I guess. Uh, for example, one of the things that he told me is that if you wanted to replace all the phone screens on the planet with graphene, you only need 60 kilos of it. I mean, that's 60 kilos versus, I don't know, I don't even know how many tons we use of plastic and, and glass to build our phone screens. Um, in the data center space, it's going to be very interesting to see how people use it for um, heat management and thermal management. And there's a study in Sweden that has actually found that you can reduce heat management, heat, heat consumption, I think, within the, the processor or the server 
by 25%, which is a lot, because as we know, I mean, that's one of the biggest bills um, in the data center space. Um, and then as well, there's this thing, new thing that they're looking at, which is lithium graphene, um, which if they get it right, will basically replace most of the battery and generators in the data center space, which would then free up a lot of floor space, um, which means more money and more space to put service to make more money. Um, and I, actually speaking of space, I think the other one is going to be really disruptive in the next 50 plus years, if they really get it right and it gets commercialized properly, it's DNA storage. Um, so I found about DNA storage at a Microsoft conference a few years ago. Um, I think it was 2017 or something. And this scientist, she came to, to the stage and she started talking about it. And as she was talking about it, most people just start leaving. And I was like, this is actually quite interesting. I mean, I didn't understand half of it because you became very technical because you can think of those like Beverly scientists like when they go down, they go down and you're like, all right, I don't understand. Now you need to translate this to something else. Um, but it's basically, you can put a lot of data in a small smear um, and that smear will be enough to replace, uh, well, actually that smear, if you put enough together about the size of two dice, so about the size of your thumb, that could replace the data center with 200,000 square feet. Um, so, I mean, that will be very, very disruptive to the industry. Um, there's a few challenges with DNA storage, like uh, retrieving the data sometimes, but they are getting through those stages and there's different levels of development that they've gone through, which includes um, storing and restoring, I think the British Encyclopedia or something like that. Um, so there's all those nice things that data scientists do um, and they're getting through it. So I think over the next 10 years, you'll see something being commercialized. And then of course, they'll have to have market education. Um, the pricing needs to come down I mean, it will be very disruptive if it really picks up. Um, it doesn't mean that maybe everything will go into it, but if a lot of things go into it, they'll be very interesting. Um, because, I mean, I think but there's a, a stat that says that by 2030, we are only going to be able to store 3% or 5% of the data that we produce on this planet. Um, and by 2040, it's only 0.5%, which means we, we can't store anything. Um, and I mean, people are looking at storage in space and everything, but that is just too expensive. I mean, you, not, not everyone has a hundred million dollars to put um, a storage facility in space. They, can, they might be hit by a meteor, then you lose your hundred million and all the people's data. So <laughs> I think we have to look at options within our Earth conference. <laughs> Very long answer. And then of course, things like nanotechnology. I like that as well. You know, uh, you just blew my mind by going, you know, out, outside to the uh, hypers, you know, space uh, data consolidation and management and storage to um, uh, going going nano too. Um, really, uh, really crazy. It sounds like a, a new world. Um, like, uh, you know, Tom Cruise is is listening in, taking notes for his next sci-fi, you know, action movie. Um, but On top of it's coming. But you know the truth is, COVID has really accelerated at an incredible rate digital transformation, and what uh, sounded you know very space age talk, you know, um, just uh, you know wouldn't have had these conversations even uh, you know several years ago. Now uh, you know with COVID, um, we, we've built some necessary uh, infrastructure to uh, to really um, stay in pace uh, for for all this this this. Uh, the need of needs of the future. So, with that, um, is there anything you may have used or experienced in the past year that you don't think you would have tried if it weren't for the pandemic? Um, well, in the biggest scheme of things, I'll say working from home because mm. uh, I actually I do like going to the office and being around other human beings and talking and just having a banter and then going for a drink at the end of the day has all journalists pretty much do. Um, yeah, on the technology front, nothing has really changed because, I mean, if you're in the office, if you're at home or if you're in the field reporting on something, you kind of use the same things that you use now. So we did a lot of um, webinar links or Zoom calls as well. Um, all the apps on your phone, we used to use them all anyway. Um, Teams, email, everything was was being used. The only thing that probably I started doing that I, wouldn't, that I wasn't touching on yet was probably podcast. Um, so I started them, I think, towards the end of summer last year. Um, so maybe that was a good thing coming out of the pandemic was forcing me into the podcast, podcast route. Uh, but other than that, I wouldn't say it has really changed um, my digital usage <laughs> that much. Um, 
But I, I mean, our industry has done really well though. That there hasn't been really any outages. There hasn't been any massive problems. Um, and I think they've managed to cope very well. Um, I mean, we know that in Europe, there's been some rationing of uh, bandwidth, um, which is very interesting to see how governments step into that one with the operators to make sure that everyone will have access to bandwidth um, and making sure the emergency service will be able to cope. Um, so I think out of everything bad, there's always positive stuff that comes out of it. And I think the pandemic really brought a really nice side of our industry, which is put everyone working together, um, competitors, partners, communities, to really keep getting the internet and the digital world going. Um, and I mean, there's no stepping back. I think, I, in my personal opinion, this is not a startup in any way. In my personal opinion, I think we've sort of advanced 10 years um, in terms of digital adoption, cloud adoption, everything um, in the last 12 months. Great insights. Uh, you know, we're part of this hyper-connected industry, uh, this this world on this call, but but what do you enjoy doing to disconnect, to take a mental health break, to let go of all the devices and apps uh, and, and really uh, get away? Uh, I mean, out of lockdown, gym. Because <laughs> right now we can't do any of that. Um, we're still in lockdown in the UK, so and we still got quite a few weeks to go. Um, but yeah, I mean, usually just gym, just going out with friends. Um, I mean, Lish is having like a chat with someone face to face. And I think those things, we value those things a lot more now than we did before. Um, just being physically close to someone and having a conversation um, is completely different. It's the amount of times I, not the amount of times I go out now, because I don't even go out that much anymore. Um, but when I go out now, I, I actually struggle to speak to another human being um, face to face. It takes a few seconds for the brain to be like, oh, there's another person here. How do I talk to this person now? Um, so that's that's all quite nice. But yeah, I mean, Jim, just being around friends. Um, I know it sounds very cliche, but it's pretty much it. Um, Netflix has become a big thing over the last 12 months. Um, I don't think I'll be Netflixing as much <laughs> once things open up. Yeah, I was hoping there'd be a bottle of Porto and a beach in Portugal in this answer somewhere. But uh, say la vie, we'll have to wait till, uh, you know, uh, next spring. Well, I am always working though. That's the thing, because I mean, we might be in lockdowns and everything, but I'm always at my laptop. Um, so even if I was somewhere, I wouldn't really be doing everything <laughs> that I was doing. Um, I mean, I actually spent a lot of my lockdown um, in Paris, and I mean, most of my day was spent in front of the laptop. So it was exactly the same. It was exactly the same thing as being in London, um, apart from the. You know, the, the beauty of a laptop is you can transport it to the beach. So it's uh, it's an amazing. But then the sun over hits it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have done that <laughs> and you can't really um see the screen <laughs> oh I, I'll, I'll give you some tips here on on uh beach friendly laptop computing but uh Please jamie do. i think you you have some some more questions uh too yeah i'm excited about this next section because again you know data movers uh we're unique in that we really want to <laughs> see and hear the backgrounds of, of our industry leaders. So this is a, a fun section called Rapid Fire, where just you know respond with the first thing that comes to mind. Um, so let's talk Netflix. You mentioned it. What's the last series you watched on Netflix, and do you recommend it? Um, I never recommend it. I'd say whoever did it was probably quite high when they did it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's um, Aliens World. Uh, or Aliens Worlds or something like that. It's basically, it's this thing where they created like a sci-fi doco, doco film. Uh, I think it's a British one as well. And they look into how life works on Earth and then they imagined uh, life in exoplanets. Um, I mean, this has nothing to do with data centers, so it's nothing to do with no, aliens. Cool. It's, yeah. um, it's really interesting because I mean, some of the creatures that they came up with, like the arms and the eyes and the way they, they feed themselves and the predators and I mean, even to reproduction, you're like, God, I mean, it's, you're like, the human brain has no limits. It's, <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's just, it's not like your normal watching. It's not like uh, Behind Her Eyes or, or Bridget or something like that, but it is interesting. It gets you out there and gets your thinking going uh, and be like, yeah, we probably are well um, on planet Earth. <laughs> we don't need to go anywhere else. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a big sci-fi gal, so uh, I might, I might <laughs> sketch a, a series uh, like that. So what are three words that uh, other people use to describe you? Hmm. Well, let's go for the good ones. 
Um, I mean, I'll say probably ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always thinking more. I mean, even the media, media entrepreneur thing kind of shows that. Yeah. Um, rely, reliable. Um, I'm very reliable and loyal. Uh, and I do really appreciate that with people as well. Um, I'll probably just say hardworking. I mean, you've seen I don't even go to the beach with my laptop to make sure <laughs> it, gets, <laughs> it gets done. <laughs> And you know what? I, I absolutely agree with those three words, uh, knowing you uh, as, as, as well as we do here at JSA. Um, you are absolutely reliable, hardworking, um, ambitious, but, uh, you know, good hearted too. Just uh, anyway, uh, if you could go one place in the world right now, if there were no travel restrictions, where would it be? Oh, uh, I mean, because right now it's hard not to think of the travel restrictions. So with that, I would probably say Israel, just for the fact that are fully open and the vaccination program is going well, is going very well there. So, I mean, you've got everything open, nightclubs, beaches, um, everything is open. The gyms are open, restrictions are being eased every day. Um, so it's almost like normal life um, in a very messy world. Um, if things were a bit more normal and easy, then probably go to like um, Vanatu or something, like those islands there, like north of New Zealand, just get away from everything for a while. All right, best restaurant uh, that you've ever been to? And uh, you're a global traveler, so uh, mm. I'm interested in this one. Yeah, I mean, so I'm really bad with names though, that's the problem. I can <laughs> memorize places in my head um, with maps, but I can't memorize the names. I mean, there's quite a few in St. Louis and Shanghai. But I'll probably say like, because I really like the dessert, I'm a big like dessert person. Um, it's one in Berlin, and I don't really know the name, but I think it's more like um, Brau, Bottom, um, Haus, Fox, Platz, something like that. I mean, I can look for the name and you can put it on this. We'll the insert the link here. <laughs> yeah, this my, my, my German is not the best. Uh, but it's, it's in between like the Brandenburg Gate and uh, Checkpoint Charlie, um, and it's in a small square. And then basically, you go in, it's a mixture between um, a charcuterie and a restaurant so you get the meat from where they also sell it to outside uh, and i mean you get your normal like roosts and sausages and everything and meat and all this sort of stuff but they also have like a huge variety of beer and there's one i think imperial which i haven't found anywhere else uh it's really good to stout and the ice cream meets it's i mean it's homemade so it's meat so beer and ice cream that that's my favorite so i, I mean, can't I wait to go to berlin great. again <laughs> yeah Sign me up. And it's, last last question. What is the favorite uh, app on your phone? What do you use most often? Mm. I mean, LinkedIn is a huge one that I always use, but I think one, a new one that I've come across recently, it's Pocket. Because mm -hmm. um, I think as a journalist, it's actually quite a useful one to have. So basically, whatever you go on your phone, like any Chrome pages or Apple pages, Google News, Guardian, New York Times, Washington Post, whatever, you can save those articles into this app. And then go back to them later. Um, so it's a nice aggregate. It's a very easy thing to aggregate the news that you don't have time to read. Um, and then you actually can build a profile there for yourself as well and share some news that you really feel like, oh, this would be good for my audience. And you can share stuff with them. So you have the private site. Right. And the public yeah, site. downloading it now. That, that's a great <laughs> tip. Yeah. All three of us are like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, Jao. It's, it's it was, such an honor and so fun to just catch up and learn learn about uh, you know what makes you tick um, as you are certainly um, helping our industry um, really uh, learn and grow uh, with your coverage. So we appreciate you. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And I mean, thank you to the industry as well because a lot of people have had the patience to teach a lot of things to me. So <laughs> it's always a good thing. And guys, if you enjoyed today's Data Movers podcast, hope you did, um, be sure to check out more, jsa.net slash podcasts. Every other week on Wednesday mornings, we release a new episode. Yeah, and be sure to follow us on Twitter, uh, my favorite media platform, the Jay Scotto and Evan Christel, where we can continue the conversation. Absolutely. And as always, guys, happy networking. <laughs>